What's going on friends? Welcome back to another New World video. Today we're going to be talking about the Hive of Gorgons. This is New World Eternum's first 10 player raid and it's something that you'll want to be clearing every week ideally due to the high frequency of 725 gear score items that it gives and also chromatic seals and the Gorgonite Inductor, both of which are needed for upgrading artifacts to 725. So basically if you want to get the best stuff in the game, you will need to get into the Hive of Gorgons and be clearing it ideally once a week because the bosses within the Hive of Gorgons drop loot once a week. Now, I've seen a lot of people struggling to get through the Hive, especially with the second boss. So in this video, we're going to be covering pre-raid preparation, team composition, and some general tips and tricks you can use for dealing with the three bosses you'll encounter in the Hive of Gorgons raid. For your team composition, typically you'll want to go for one tank, two healers, and seven damage players. Now, I'm going to be linking some builds in the description below for a more detailed look at attributes and weapon mastery and all that stuff. But I'd say the standard tank build of sword and shield with a warhammer full heavy armor, that's going to be very effective for the Hive of Gorgons. For your healers playing life staff and void gauntlet, 350 focus, light armor, or you could actually have one of the healers play with a flail as a secondary. I think that is also viable as well, but obviously both of them are going to be running life staff. And then when it comes to damage players, there is a little bit of variety that you want to be doing here. You want to make sure that you have one or two players using slash based damage weapons. So that would include the hatchet, the greatsword. Uh, and you also want to make sure that you have a couple, maybe two to three of your damage players who can bring ranged weapons as well. Now, why you need to bring those specific weapon types, we will be covering in the actual boss sections. Uh, spoilers, the final boss in particular, uh, you do need slashing weapons to deal with mechanics and you need ranged weapons to be able to deal with mechanics. And honestly, in the first boss, ranged weapons are pretty good as well. <laughs> and like I say, we'll cover those within the uh, specific guides. In terms of ranged weapons, fire staff, bow, or even musket can be pretty good, I think, for both the first and final boss. Now, as I mentioned, uh, for like the full deep dive on the builds and how I would set up the stats and weapons and stuff, check out the links in the description down below. And of course, why the weapons are relevant, those will be in the boss section. But let's move on to raid preparation. What can you have ready with your character before you even step into the Hive of Gorgons? One of the most important pieces of gear that you'll want to collect, and you'll want to collect a couple of them before you enter the Hive of Gorgons, is your amulet. The reason why the amulet is so important one is it because it can have this protection perk on it. So at time of recording, there are nine different types of damage in the game, six elemental and three physical. And there is a corresponding protection perk for each one of those types of damage. So we have nature protection over here. We have strike protection. We have frozen protection. You guys get the idea. Now the three different bosses in Hive of Gorgons largely just do one type of damage. And as a result, Getting a amulet with the corresponding protection perk that mitigates that damage along with a gem that also works against that damage can be hugely advantageous and uh, drastically reduce the damage you take from that particular boss. So for example, with the first boss, Echidna, Echidna does a lot of strike damage. So having an amulet with strike damage absorption, I think I actually have one down here as well as the one that I've currently got in my gear set. Yeah, we have strike protection and then we also have the corresponding gem, which is a cut pristine Jasper. By combining these two things together, I'm giving myself 20% strike damage absorption. So I'm taking 20% less strike damage, which is almost all of the damage that the first boss does. As a result, I just take away less damage from Echidna. And if everybody on your team has these, it just makes the fight a lot smoother. People are less likely to die or get one shot. Makes it easier for the healer to keep, uh, you know, keep on top of everybody's health boss. Now for the second and third boss, you are going to see a lot of nature damage. There is also quite a bit of slashing damage from Typhon, the second boss, but I think that's more for the tank to worry about. Nature damage is largely gonna be the thing that gets you in the second boss and especially in the third boss. So having the nature protection perk on the amulet along with a cut pristine amber, this is giving us 21% nature damage absorption. So cutting the damage drastically down when it comes to fighting Typhon and it comes to fighting the final boss, Broodmother Medusa. Again, the, the TLDR, what I'm saying here is before you go into the raid, you really want to be looking for an amulet with strike protection and then ideally the corresponding attributes that would be okay for your build. Uh, and then you want to be looking for an amulet that, that has nature protection as well. The other perks on it, 
I think could be negotiable. Health and protection is pretty good. Health protection, stamina recovery. If we, if we want to really get into the perks, I'm going to link a video up in the top right. But ideally, what I'm encouraging here is just to get an amulet that has protection. Even if the, the other perks kind of poo-poo, I just think this is going to massively, massively help your chances of survival and as a result, success. So make sure you pick up a strike protection amulet with a cut pristine jasper and a nature protection amulet with a cut pristine amber and then get ready to switch those out for the first boss strike protection for the second and third you want to go for that nature protection some other steps that you want to take before entering the hive of gorgons include getting trophies in three different houses now pretty much all of the enemies within the hive of gorgons are angry earth so if you can get your basic angry earth combat trophies down in your three different houses you'll get four eight 12% bonus damage to all of the bosses and pretty much every other enemy in there as well. If you can't get the basic, the, the minor ones, which only give 3%, those should be very affordable. Obviously, there is the question of can you afford three houses, but for me, I actually just went for cheap houses right now. So I've got a uh, 5,000 gold house and a 5,000 gold house Everfall. I had to go for a 10,000 gold house. Ultimately, you want to be going for uh, the highest tier house. And again, a separate video for housing. We will get sidetracked here. But getting three houses and then putting down either a uh, minor, basic, or major is the ultimate goal. Uh, everybody having these trophies down, everybody doing 12% uh, with the major, it's 15% extra damage. That can be a big deal, especially when it comes to the second boss. Typhon. Another freebie you can bring, you can pick these up off the trading post or craft them at the Arcana station, are Angry Earth Coatings. These give you a 15% damage bonus to Angry Earth, so if you go ahead and pop one of those, it will apply it to both weapons, again allowing you to do 15% more damage. And then you have an Angry Earth Ward Potion. Once you drink this, you take 10% less damage from Angry Earth, so again, the bosses are all Angry Earth, so you can do 15% more damage to them and take 10% less damage. That is also going to help your chances of success massively. Uh, whilst you're at it, you also want to be hopping a Honing Stone. Gives you a 7% weapon damage increase. This isn't needed for healers, really, although healers doing more damage still can help. And of course, you want to make sure that you have attribute food. This is something that you'll be want to, you know, want to use in any challenging content, but increasing your attributes by 48. This one's giving me 48 extra constitution. I'll put a link down below if you're not sure what the names of all the foods are. You could also use the 44 attribute food as well. I think I have some of that down here. Let's just take a look. Uh, yeah, so fruit salad, 44, 48. The four stat difference isn't a huge game changer, but making sure that you are just using some of this food is a big deal. And finally, one more important consumable you can pick up is Desert Sunrise. You don't need this for the first boss. There isn't really any damage over time effects you'll take, but in the second boss, there are a lot of bleeds. In the third boss, there's a lot of poison. So reducing the duration of those effects can help you survive so highly recommend desert sunrise for the second and third boss and with all of these consumables that we just listed make sure you pick up like roughly about five of them unless you've got a really good group you could be in there for about two to three hours so yeah have a few angry earth ward potions few angry earth coatings some attribute food uh, your desert sunrise your hunting stone just making sure you have a decent size stack of each one of those uh, so you can pop multiple ones if needed if the fight or the, the hive of gorgons raid goes longer for your group all right now that we've got the raid preparation out of the way in terms of consumables and gear and you know what sort of players you want to be bringing let's actually talk about the bosses themselves and the mechanics so you know what to look out for and uh, how to avoid dying when you're in the hive of gorgons so echidna is the first boss of hive of gorgons and i think generally this is one of the easier fights at least compared to the second and third boss typhon and medusa the main things that are going to kill you in here is going to be the rocks mechanic along with the spikes and the jump and again we'll get into those very soon in terms of what you need to watch out for for melee players you also need to pay attention to tail swipe again we'll cover how to recognize that and what to deal with and for the uh, for the tank in particular you need to keep an eye out for this headbutt attack where it basically slams in front of you you do need to block or dodge the headbutt we only, this is only just for the tank because it only happens to the player that's standing in front of them, but it is very important for the tank to know that the boss is going to headbutt you fairly frequently. Absolutely make sure you block or dodge this because it is going to do pretty much all of your health with, as strike damage. Now, one thing that's unique about this boss fight is it has a stamina bar. Compared to Typhon and Medusa, which don't have stamina bars, Echidna does, and you can lower its stamina by doing heavy attacks with melee weapons or with your ranged weapons, or you could use the pillars mechanic, which we'll cover in a little bit. That also allows you to do bonus stamina damage. 
When Echidna loses all of its stamina, it will fall over, which allows you to hit it in the back. That's the uh, black spines. Every single attack that hits the black spines will be a guaranteed critical or a backstab. So make sure when it falls over that you do hit it uh, on the back, on the on the side where the spines are. So the first mechanic you're going to see fairly frequently is stomp. Basically, it just lifts up its foot and then it stomps down on the ground, causing large strike damage to everybody in the arena and also slightly lowering any pillars that might have popped up. You can avoid taking damage from the stomp by blocking or dodging just before it happens. But if you do get hit like I do in this clip here, just drink a potion, go back to full. Healers might want to consider using Splash of Light as an ability to counteract stomp. If stomp's going to be frequently hitting all players in your team, you can basically instantly heal them back up to full by hitting the Splash of Light ability. Another frequent mechanic you'll see throughout the Echidna fight is the rocks. Echidna summons eight rocks, four to the left and four to the right, and then launches them out in a straight line. Whilst doing this, Echidna also raises its tail and then slams it down behind it, uh, causing a large damage to anybody who's behind the boss. You can avoid taking damage from the rocks and the tail by blocking, dodging, or simply just moving out of the way. Another interesting part of this boss fight is the pillars. So periodically throughout the fight, you're going to see this little, uh, these white runes appear on the ground and like bubbling rocks, and then a pillar will pop out from those areas. If you're standing in that area, you'll get popped up in the air, take a little bit of damage, but you will have the advantage that when you're on top of the pillar, you do bonus stamina damage with your ranged attacks to Echidna, and you'll also avoid taking damage from the stomp mechanic, but every stomp will lower the pillar a little bit lower to the ground. Be wary though, whenever Echidna uses the raw mechanic, which we'll cover later on, these pillars will glow white and then eventually explode, killing anybody on top or nearby to them. Something else you're going to see fairly frequently are spikes or obsidian crystal. I like to call them spikes though. Basically, Echidna launches a series of spikes from its back and they land in various locations throughout the arena. These need to be destroyed before Echidna uses the raw ability or before they shoot out purple lines, which we'll cover in a little bit. After these spikes are launched, Echidna typically always does the rocks mechanic or it will do jump if it's below 50% HP. So whilst you are running over to kill any spikes that might put your teammates in danger, make sure you do keep an eye on the boss so you don't get hit by rocks or the potential jump that might come afterwards. We briefly mentioned it, but something else that you'll see with the spikes is they, after if they're not dealt with in a long enough period of time, they will glow these purple lines as sort of in a pattern around them. And then shortly afterwards, these vines will come out and do a large amount of damage to anybody who's nearby. The best way to deal with this is either to stay away from the spikes altogether, or if you've been damaging them for about 10 seconds, you haven't got them all down, and then again, just retreat. Make sure you're not near any spikes if they've been there for quite some time. This is why it's important to make sure you kill the spikes early on, especially the ones that are going to be nearby your players who are actively engaged in the fight. You can leave the ones towards the back of the arena, provided it's not later on in the fight. If the boss is underneath 50% HP, you generally want to make sure you get rid of all of the obsidian crystals, Otherwise, it will result in a team wipe. Overall, it's a pretty easy fight. And like I say, that strike protection really does make a big difference. It's not really too much of a, a DPS check here. So you could play higher constitution. As long as you can kill those spikes in time, uh, everything else is fair game. Make sure you are trying to do a good amount of stamina damage as that just keeps the fight easier. You know, if you want one other thing as well, I could say is try not to do too much stamina damage before the spikes happen. Otherwise, you're just going to miss out on, you know, the freebie. So you ideally want to have the boss lose all of its stamina when there's no spikes or anything else on the field. So you can just completely focus on the boss. So now we're going to move on to Typhon, who is the second boss of Hive of Gorgons. In my opinion, this is the hardest boss in the raid. I typically find that if you're in the spot where you can kill Typhon, then you can almost certainly kill Broodmother Medusa, which is the third and final boss. One of the reasons why Typhon is so challenging for many raid groups is it is what we call a DPS or damage check. So Typhon summons adds or minions periodically throughout the fight. These are birds and wolves and spiders. You need to kill these minions in time, in particular the birds followed by the wolves. Otherwise, he will absorb them, making Typhon a lot stronger, and it will also do damage to you based on the number of enemies he absorbs. The problem with this, though, is there are several other mechanics that usually overlap with the minions being summoned, including the circles mechanic, and sometimes you have these red lanes that appear 
throughout the arena as well. So let's move through each one of these mechanics one by one and break them down and describe how you guys can best deal with them as you see them in the boss fight. One of the first things you'll likely see is what I call circles. You basically get this red circle underneath two party members, followed by three party members later on, and then finally four party members towards the end of the fight. Any player that has this circle underneath them really needs to get away from everybody else as soon as possible. The reason why is shortly after you get the circle, spikes are going to pop up underneath your feet one, two, three times. So you'll have three different instances of spikes popping up. After that, you're safe. You can move back in next to the boss. But if you're not fast at moving this out from your party, it's going to hit multiple people. It's going to do a lot of damage. It's going to ruin the raid, basically. So if you have a circle underneath your feet, you need to get away from everybody else really quickly. And you need to make sure you keep moving the whole time. If you stand still, uh, the spikes will hit you and most likely kill you as well. Another mechanic you'll see early on is what I call lanes. Basically, the three lanes, so one to the left, one in the middle, and one on the right, become uh, slowly fill up with this red reddish area. And then shortly afterwards, vines will pop up in that area anybody who's in there is going to take a ton of nature damage every second so basically once you see the red sort of slowly filling up on the ground move out of that area wait for the vines to pop up and then later on you can move back in there the problem with the lanes is sometimes you will find that minions spawn in here if a minion has spawned in the lanes area you're simply gonna to have to wait until it comes back out wait until the uh the, the vines go away because again if you stand in this area it's going to do a lot of damage to you something else that can make it very tricky to deal with the spikes and the lanes is the vines mechanic so throughout the fight typhon is going to throw these vines at people you'll see him sort of sweep up his arm and then scoop and he'll send these vines towards various party members if it hits you it will put you in a thorny maiden the way to deal with this is basically to break yourself out by dealing damage. However, if your healer gets trapped in this, uh, you probably want to help them out, you know, because they're not going to be able to move anywhere. And then if they do have the spikes or they do have the lane or something else, they're in a lot of trouble. So if you see anybody in a thorny maiden, basically try and break them out with damage as soon as you can. And as we mentioned earlier, the biggest and most important mechanic with the Typhon fight is the summoning of adds. So it starts off typically with just one bird and one wolf, and then progressively more get added over time. You're going to find these Corvid enemies, and then the other one is called a Werewolf or something like that. For most groups, the play is to focus on the Corvid first. The reason behind this is because the Corvid, if it is absorbed by Typhon, it gives him an Empower, making him do more damage, which is more likely going to one-shot your tank or get your party members killed. So you want to focus on the Corvid enemies first, uh, because they are the most threatening buff you know, that they can give to, to Typhon when he absorbs them. Now, the problem with the COVID enemies is they fly around all over the place. They are incredibly annoying. So one of the ways you can deal with them is using root-based effects. So Grasping Vines, the Heart Rune, is one of the easiest ways that you can get this. You could also use Great Axe. You can use Reap to pull them in, Gravity Well. Even using Musket with Traps, potentially not a bad idea. Uh, Putrefying Scream on the Void Gauntlet is a root. Basically anything that's going to lock the Corvid down and stop it from moving around. Because if it can, it's going to fly backwards, it's going to fly into spikes, it's going to just cause all kinds of nightmares. Also with the Wolves, you do need to be worried that they can charge at you and pin you to the ground. This can be very annoying if you have lots of people and a Werewolf charges at them, it's going to knock them all down. Uh, lowering the amount of damage uptime you have. And as we mentioned, you do need to be mindful of spikes happening while these ads are being summoned, because if you're all sort of ganging up on the on the COVID bird and then somebody gets spikes, it could wipe your party. So this, for me, is a little bit of RNG in terms of can you get the mechanics to be in your favor or not. But just know that it's very important to make sure that you kill the COVID enemies first, typically followed by the werewolves. And if you can clump them all up, clump them all up together, that's going to help you a lot. The spiders usually aren't something you need to worry about, but be wary, they will likely go for your healer, because your healer is going to be healing this whole time, generating aggro on the spiders, and the spiders do hit really hard. So whilst they're not really that threatening, they, they only die, they or they do die rather, in like two to three hits. Uh, just, just be wary as a healer that the spiders are a bit spooky, they slow you a lot, and they do a lot of damage. So maybe just throwing like one or two attacks their way, it's probably going to help you out. Typhon also frequently uses this slam ability. Usually he'll run into the middle of the room, he'll sort of crouch down, jump up in the air, and then when he hits the ground, he'll do a large amount of strike damage to everybody in the area. The best way to deal with this is either to block or dodge just before he hits the ground. 
But if you don't, you are going to take a lot of damage. Again, this is another one where healers can use Splash of Light to potentially top everybody up if they're running that ability. After defeating the Corvid and Werewolf enemies, or if Typhon absorbs them, he will always move into what I call the Hide mechanic. So he's going to choose one party member and put these red eyes above their head. When you see this, you need to very quickly go and hide behind one of the four pillars. Later on, it's only going to be two and then eventually one pillar. You basically need to get yourself behind a pillar before you get stunned. Otherwise, Typhon will charge at you and instantly kill you. Won't even knock you down, you'll just instantly die. So when you see the hide mechanic, this always happens after you kill the summon minions or, you know, you don't kill them in time. Basically, after any minion phase, you're always going to get the hide where you need to run behind a pillar. If you don't, you are going to instantly die. And finally, the only other major thing to know about with the Typhon fight is the phasing. So once Typhon falls below 70% HP, he will run through into the next section of the bridge, and then you'll have a new set of pillars over there. If you stay in the previous room that he was in, you're going to die because it slowly fills up with vines. So yeah, when you get him to 70%, he runs through the wall. You just need to follow him through. And then the same thing happens again at 30%. When he gets to 30%, he's then going to run through to the next section of the room. And again, just follow the boss through. Make sure you don't stay in the previous area too long. There is some tactics that you can use with this. What we typically find is on the second wave of minions. So the second time that he summons Corvids and uh, the werewolves, we're actually pretty close to getting him to 70%. So we usually actually avoid killing the minions so we can just phase him and push him into the next room because they'll all die and then I'll instantly move into the next area and he doesn't actually absorb them. So if you've got enough damage, you can actually just pump DPS onto the boss basically and avoid the minions and then just force him to 70% or lower and he'll instantly move into the next section of the fight. I think that pretty much covers all of the major mechanics with Typhon. Again, it doesn't really sound like too much, but it's just the overlapping of uh, the minions that he summons and killing them in time whilst trying to avoid all the other chaos that goes on. If you can get those minions down fast, then you're pretty much solid. So like I say, doing a lot of damage is really the secret here, making sure you have a high damage build and making sure you're coordinated to take down those Corvids before they start flying everywhere. As we mentioned at the beginning of the video, a lot of the damage from vines is nature damage and also the, uh, the spiky lanes and stuff like that. There is a a lot of nature damage in this fight but if you're going to be standing in front of the boss uh, as a tank he also does a lot of slashing damage and the bleeds in particular slash damage also reduces that as well so particularly for a tank you might want to consider going slash protection or even putting slash ward i think it's called slash shield ward on your tower shield that might help you out there as well the third and final boss fight of hive of gorgons is brood mother medusa now, if you're able to take down Typhon, in my opinion, you'll usually be strong enough to be able to take down this final boss as well. The main thing with Medusa is there's just a lot of different mechanics and stuff that you need to stay on top of. So she summons flowers on the ceiling. In order to deal with these, you will need ranged players. This is where the ranged DPS really comes in. Having a bow or a musket or a fire staff to take down the flowers as soon as possible. She also summons eggs, and the interesting thing about the eggs is they only really take damage from strike and slash. Slashing in particular is going to be the damage type you want to go for, because slashing is also effective against the angry earth. So bringing hatchet or greatsword into this boss fight in particular is going to be a huge deal. I would say you typically want to make sure you have at least two ranged damage players and at least two slashing damage players as well. So uh, in particular, Hatchet with Inferno, because uh, Inferno is a fire staff range damage, and then Hatchet, although you can just use throwing Hatchet as well, to be honest. Hatchet is going to be a great weapon here and great sword for dealing with those eggs as well. Another unique aspect to the Medusa fight is the water. So you have these fountains on the side of the room, and you can use the water or the fountains to cleanse various effects throughout the boss fight. All of the damage that you're going to take in here, or the most relevant forms of damage, is going to be nature which is why the nature protection amulet is so big for this one. Although, do be aware, as a tank in front of the boss, she does a lot of striking damage, so you might still want to consider keeping that strike protection amulet, uh, but you are also going to take a lot of nature damage as a tank as well. As we mentioned, there are a lot of mechanics in this boss fight, so let's just go through them and talk about how you can deal with them one by one. The first thing you're likely going to see in the boss fight are brambles. So she shoots these like yellow things out of the top of her back, they land on the ground, and they leave these brambly thorns on the ground. These go away after a short period of time, but you definitely don't want to be standing in them as it's just going to do a lot of damage to your character so if you see brambles basically move around them don't move through them another thing that she'll launch off the top of her back are eggs so when they land on the ground you'll see these her sign eggs you want to make sure that you damage these down asap 
As we mentioned earlier though, the best form of damage and the only really effective form of damage against the eggs is slashing damage. So you want to make sure you have a hatchet or a greatsword to deal with these. If you're hitting them with uh, like a rapier or a spear or a bow or a fire staff, it's just not going to be effective at all. They take almost no damage from magical weapons and they're constantly healing all the time. So yeah, bringing slashing weapons like the hatchet or greatsword and assigning those players to the eggs, absolutely something you want to do. If they hatch, a minion will come out of them and you will need to deal with that minion as well. Sometimes the egg just lands on the ground and instantly a minion comes out, in which case you'll also need to kill that ASAP. One of the most threatening mechanics that you'll see in this boss fight are the flowers. She can spawn flowers on her back, so you'll sometimes see a flower on the back of Medusa, or you will see them on the ceiling. The only way you can really de deal with these are ranged weapons, so make sure that you bring bow or fire staff or musket, Basically, some way to do range damage to these flowers. You want to burn them down as fast as possible. The reason why you want to deal with the flowers ASAP is when they're active, you will see this mist form on the ground, sort of a whitish mist. If you stand in this mist for too long, you will fall to sleep and you won't be able to do anything with your character until somebody wakes you up. In order to wake people up, you can use the water mechanic, which we'll move on to in a second. But basically, you want to make sure you get rid of those flowers ASAP. These are the most important things to deal with in the boss fight, followed by the eggs. Deal with flowers, then deal with eggs, followed by minions. Now moving on to the water mechanic, as we covered it, you have these fountains on the side of the room. You can use them periodically. Uh, you basically pick up this glob of water and then you can throw it at a teammate or even at the ground and stand in it. The reason why the water mechanic is so important, as we covered, is you can wake up sleeping teammates. But you can also use them to cleanse the little gross volcanoes that she summons on the ground. So you'll see these little pustules. You can throw water at them to remove them. You can also throw water at the ground to remove your poison stacks. When you stand near these little gross volcanoes, you're going to get a lot of poison damage. Periodically, she'll make somebody in the group what I call stinky. So somebody will be uh, have this green aura coming off of them with little mushrooms underneath their feet. If you want to cleanse the stinkiness, you also need to either throw water at yourself or have somebody throw water at you as well. So just making sure that you occupy a spot near the fountains and then using the water to help out your teammates and yourself is a huge part of staying on top of the mechanics in this boss fight. Making sure that somebody deals with the volcanoes, throws water at the volcanoes, wakes up the tank if they fall asleep, uh, it can all just help the fight go a lot smoother. However, if you throw water at the back of the boss, if you land it too close to her, she's going to get angry and then she's going to charge in the direction that water came from typically. So yeah, be mindful that if you do throw water at the boss, she will turn around and charge very fast in the opposite direction and anybody that is in her path is going to take a lot of damage. So be mindful that if you throw water too near to Medusa, you are going to trigger the charge mechanic. And finally, one other thing to make the fight a little bit more awkward are the obstructing vines. So occasionally the fountains are going to get vines spawning over the top of them and you will not be able to get the water from the fountains until you DPS down the vines. Any player can deal with these, so you could have your ranged players, you could have your melee players, your hatchet, your greatsword, your fire staff, whatever, but you just want to make sure that you deal with the vines. I wouldn't say it's important to deal with these compared or as important when comparing to the flowers and the eggs, but it would certainly be like third on the priority list. Not being have access to water is pretty bad for the fight as the water is needed for quite a lot of the mechanics of the cleansing of the sleep and uh, the gross volcanoes in particular. And I think that pretty much covers it for Medusa guys. Like I say, it's just a case of dealing with the flowers, dealing with the eggs, dealing with the vines. And then when you get a free moment, just doing damage to the boss and you'll slowly whittle her down. Make sure you keep an eye out on anybody who is stinky in the boss fight. If they have the glowing green aura, throw some water at them. If it's yourself, throw some water at the ground and stand in it. Uh, if you're going to fall asleep, make sure you communicate it to your teammates. You can sometimes see how many stacks you have. It's at 10 stacks is when you fall to sleep. So you see the little sleepy eye icon, red debuff on your hotbar. Once that gets to 10, you're going to fall asleep. But again, just have somebody chuck water at you, you wake back up. Make sure you deal with the ads, make sure you're not standing in the brambles and near the little gross volcanoes, you can get rid of those again by throwing water at them. Overall, I don't think it's that challenging of a fight, there's just a lot of stuff going on, but if you can stay on top of it, 
I find it to be pretty easy. And with all of those boss mechanics out of the way, I think that pretty much wraps up our guide for the Hive of Gorgon's Friend. Again, uh, if you have any suggestions you want to leave for fellow people, if, there's, if you think there's anything important that I missed in the boss mechanics, because it's entirely important, something that I, uh, some people say that the particular phasing in which the mechanics happen, like, oh, Echidna always does this thing after this thing. I think if you just generally know what to expect, like, you know, the knowledge is half the battle or whatever. I have also put in a written version of this guide in Discord as well. So if you're somebody who prefers uh, text and images over the video, I mean, you've made it this far in the video, but if you would like a recap or something to share with a friend, you can check out the resource that I've made available in Discord here. We have graphics to sort of cover the things that we need. Uh, yeah, links to the Discord in the description down below. We also have a explanation on the sandworm fight as well. We're going to have a video once we can start consistently clearing the sandworm. There'll be a video coming out for that one as well. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested in any guides, check out the Discord. Like I say, we got all of the sort of text and notes that I use for this video. You can find links in the description down below. With that all said, friends, let me know. If you uh, enjoyed this video, consider leaving a like and subscribing for more. We do uh, plan to continue to upload new World of Tenant videos over the Christmas period. If there's any updates to the game, we'll certainly be covering those as well. Hopefully this video helped you guys out with a hive of Gorgons. And uh, as always, I'll catch you all in the next video.